Hello and welcome to The Past is a Foreign Pantry with me, Ellie. And in case you couldn't tell, we're in the 1920s. Uh, that's as much acting as I'm going to be doing. You can tell it's 1920s because of the very precarious hairstyle uh, and also this cigarette holder which I got for like £2.50 off Amazon and when you take the cigarette out, doubles as a magic wand! So, you know, a great use of my money there. Now, I think when most people think of the 1920s, by which I mean me, they think of the Great Gatsby, that kind of roaring 20s, amazing dresses, pearls, glitz, glam, or they think of Downton Abbey Series 3. Maybe, I never really watched Downton Abbey Series 3. But I think that that is, you know, what the 1920s is to most people when they think of it. But that reality really, that's only the reality for a very small section, you know, the bright young things of London with surnames like Ponsonby and Plunkett Green. Uh, the majority of Londoners are living a very, very different lifestyle. Remember that Britain has suffered a huge loss in World War One. So the whole country is, is coming to terms with the lost generation of men the decade before. So the dinners and the dancing is not actually going to be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Now having said that, obviously because it is what we think of when we think of the 1920s, that's why I have this outfit on. But you can't talk about the 1920s in Britain without mentioning Ireland. So in 1921, uh, the Irish Free State is created, and this basically partitions off Ireland. So you have um, the Republic of Ireland in the south, and you have the Northern Ireland in the north. But it had been a very, very bloody road to get to 1921. And there was a lot of conflict between British forces and the Royal Irish Constabulary, which was supported by um, members of the Black and Tans, a group of ex-soldiers from World War One that were sent over to support... British forces in Ireland and the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. The Black and Tans and K Company um, of the Auxiliary Forces of the RIC burnt the city of Cork in what they saw as an acceptable use of violence. More than 300 people's homes were destroyed and businesses were razed to the ground. It was described by eyewitnesses as being akin to scenes that they'd seen in World War I. Many who had witnessed scenes in France and Flanders say that nothing they have experienced was comparable with the punishment meted out in Cork. While we think of the 1920s as the roaring 20s and a time of great fun and decadence, actually, for a lot of people, um, fighting is still ongoing. World War I has ended, but a new battle is on the horizon and a fight for independence and a fight for, you know, freedom, essentially, from a dwindling British empire. But back in Britain, people were also still reeling from the effects of World War I. And statistics from the 1921 census show that approximately 1.1 million women between the ages of 25 and 34 were, <gasps> shock horror, unmarried. <laughs> the belief that Britain was, you know, running mad with young things in their 20s, unattached, not listening to anybody, dancing, drinking, having a generally good time, led to the idea of the flapper and this, you know, slightly wild woman living her best life. And that, I'm sure, is true for some. But the 1920s middle-class housewife, hoping that after the war, the servants would return to her house, had to become an unwilling, independent agent within her own household. And the women had to kind of work out how do you, how do you cook for the first time for some of them in their lives. And I can just imagine the absolute horror. What is a slotted spoon? How do you use a spatula? What's the difference between roasting and baking? Who is al dente? These are probably just some of the questions that these women had going through their minds and they needed some help. And this is where my book for today comes in. Now it's written by Catherine Ives, which is actually her pen name, and it's called When the Cook is Away. Uh, this is an actual genuine 1928 copy of it, and sadly I haven't got the dust jacket, which was designed by Cecil Beaton, a, a bright young thing of the 1920s. And it was written in 1928, specifically designed for those women who had lost their help around the house. 
She's straddling this kind of two divide period of the 1920s, which I think sums up 1920s cuisine really well. On the one hand, very aware, rationing has only just ended in 1920 with the end of sugar rationing. So people are used to, you know, making do with what they have. They may be a little bit wary of going back to pre-war times. They also don't have the skill or the wage or the staff to do it anymore. But also, there's an attitude of, do you know what? We've just been through hell and we've survived and we're alive. Let's live a little bit. Let's make something that's delicious and let's, you know, never mind if there's a little bit left over. Let's put sugar in things again. Ah. So you have some very traditional English dishes. You have dishes which she says these are particularly cheap for households on a budget. But then you also have her tentatively offering a new way of doing things. Things like fish with a Mexican sauce and Spanish rice. To the 1920s audience, that would have been really revolutionary and very exciting. So there is no standard 1920s meal. There is no standard 1920s lifestyle. And this, with the cocktail and the cigarette and everything, may be what we think of when we think of 1920s. But it's a very small subsection of that. Despite that, it is obviously the most fun subsection of the 1920s, which is why I've gone full 1920s flapper and I intend to continue that way. I'm gonna drink my cocktail. I'm gonna smoke my fake cigarette wherever it is. Or, or maybe pull a rabbit out of hat, I don't know. Um, and I'm gonna take you on a 1920s tour of Middle Class Kitchen. So, cheers, enjoy. To make cream of cucumber soup, you will need three cucumbers, 28 grams of plain flour, 950 ml of chicken stock, 42 grams of butter, salt, pepper, one leek, 140 ml of milk, a tablespoon of double cream, whole mace. Peel the cucumbers and cut them into small pieces. Peel and chop the leek. Place the leek into a pan which the butter has been melted into. Add the cucumber and combine. Add the chicken stock to the pan and leave it to simmer. Crush the mace up in a pestle and mortar and add the mace pepper and salt to the pan. Allow the whole mixture to simmer gently for about one hour until the cucumber is very soft. Once the cucumber has cooked, put the flour into a bowl and add the milk, stirring all the time so that it stays very smooth. Carefully add a couple of ladles of the hot liquid to the milk and stir. Then add all of the milk back to the cucumber soup and mix in. Pour the soup through a sieve and then return back to the pan. Once it has cooked for a further 10 minutes, serve in a bowl and drizzle cream over the top. Okay, cucumber soup. Now, it's definitely cucumber. Mm, not unpleasant. But it's a very weird mix of quite creamy because of the milk and then obviously the cream on top and then quite watery and very green afterwards. So it's a bit of a weird dichotomy, can I use that word here? Bit, bit of a weird mix, maybe like six out of ten. Hmm. Anyway, on to fish souffle. To make fish souffle you will need 225 grams of hake and 225 grams of haddock. 56 grams of butter plus extra for buttering the souffle dish. Two carrots, two eggs, the juice of half a lemon, two onions, salt, 52 grams of plain flour, 570 mils of milk, a tablespoon of red wine vinegar, and spices. Six peppercorns, a blade of mace, a clove, two bay leaves, and a sprig of thyme. Begin by peeling and chopping the onions. Peel and chop the carrots. Place the onions and carrots into a litre of water. Add one bay leaf, three peppercorns, half of the thyme and a tablespoon of salt to the pan. Add the red wine vinegar and place your fish into the water. Cover and cook for about 30 minutes. Meanwhile, 
Peel and chop the other onion and carrot. Add the milk to a separate pan and place the onion, carrot and remaining herbs and spices to this. In a third pan, melt the butter. Add small amounts of flour, a little bit at a time, stirring constantly. Once the flour and butter has combined, remove it from the heat. Cook the milk for the bechamel sauce for about 20 minutes. Strain the milk mixture through a sieve and add it slowly to the pan of butter and flour. Keep stirring the whole time until the mixture is of a smooth consistency. Butter a souffle dish and remove your poached fish from the pan. Skin them and flake them with a couple of forks. Separate the egg yolks from the egg whites from your two eggs and whisk the egg yolks together. Add the cooked fish, egg yolks and lemon juice to the bechamel sauce and combine. Whisk your egg whites. You can use an electric handheld whisk or if you want to be authentic about it or if your husband has broken your electric handheld whisk you're going to have to use a manual one instead. When the egg whites are very very stiff gently fold them into the mixture. Place the mixture into your buttered souffle dish and cook at a high temperature about 180 degrees for 20 to 30 minutes. Don't open the oven while it's cooking. Okay, so here we are, fish souffle. Mmm, what about? That is lush. Very, very, very good. Eggy, but not too eggy. And fishy without being overpowering. Like, I think because it's white fish, it's not maybe as strong as salmon, something like that. The bechamel and the egg yolk, kind of adding them together to the fish, I think has made it very, very creamy, which is perfect. It is quite a grand dish, actually. To be honest, if I didn't know anything about cooking, I'm not sure that a souffle is something that I'd try and make, because it's, you do need to know, like, fold in your egg whites, don't open your oven, as soon as it comes out, you've got to serve it immediately. And Catherine Ives, despite being, um, really good at telling people all of the steps. She actually does omit the fact that um, once it comes out of the oven, you are gonna need to serve it immediately because if you don't, then it's obviously gonna sink and part of a souffle is the beauty of it. The fact that it's kind of puffed up slightly. This is kind of like a showstopper-ish type of meal. So, souffle, yes, very good. Definitely make again. Let's try dessert. To make panda framboise, you will need one small white loaf, two tablespoons of sugar, 600 grams of raspberries, double cream. You may also add four tablespoons of a liqueur such as maraschino, benedictine or caraco. Add the raspberries and sugar to a pan and cook until very hot and syrupy. While the raspberries are simmering, remove all of the crusts from the loaf. Once the raspberries have reduced to liquid, you can add a spirit if you like. I add four tablespoons of maraschino, but you can add anything else that you think would work. Push the raspberry mixture through a sieve and strain until it is smooth. Put the crustless loaf into a dish and baste thoroughly with the liquid. Make sure the liquid is completely coating the loaf, so you may need to turn it over. Leave the loaf to absorb the liquid over a number of hours. Remember to keep basting it. Whip the cream and place on top. Okay, I've been looking forward to this all day and the inevitable has happened, which is that it's not gone all the way through. I did think it was a little bit ambitious to have an entire loaf soaked in syrup, but, We'll see how it tastes, because I, I do love some more pudding. And it, it tastes delicious. The best bit of a summer pudding is obviously the bread. 
Nobody really wants the fruit in the middle. It's just there to make it feel like it's a healthy meal. No one's really interested in it. So this is like the best bit of summer pudding in one great big block. If I was making it again, and if you want to make this, I probably would slice it. So do slices of bread and then pour the syrup in between the slices as well to ensure that the whole thing gets soaked. That is very much a winner because it's all the best bit of summer pudding with none of the fruit bits. Now, no 1920s meal would be complete without cocktails. I know nothing about cocktails making, I know nothing about the history of cocktails. So for this, I employed the help of the aperitif guy, Paul Fogarty, uh, who's an amazing, an amazing man who knows everything there is to know about cocktail making, about the history of cocktails. I've linked to his blog here and his Twitter. Go and follow him, go and read what he has to say. If you're interested in cocktails at all, you should be aware of who this guy is. So I uh, had a meeting with him over Zoom. He really kindly gave up an hour of his time to talk me through everything. I knew nothing about it. I even said to him, like, I give this about five minutes before you clock that I have no idea what I'm talking about. And he was the nicest guy ever. And he's given me loads and loads of really, really good uh, tips. He's given me four recipes to try that are linked to the 1920s. So this is what we're going to do next. The 1920s saw the rise and rise of cocktail culture. Before this decade, the Brits tended not to do mixed drinks. A shandy was probably considered pushing it a bit. And then the prohibition happened in America, starting in 1920. Suddenly, wealthy Americans had nowhere to go to drink their sweet and fruity mixes but Europe, which had no such qualms about morals and the degradation of society. British bartenders like Harry Craddock, bartender at the Savoy, saw an opportunity to make money and began mixing cocktails to attract thirsty, wealthy Americans. The new drinks were a hit amongst the fashionable elite, and soon no dinner party was complete without a choice of cocktails. To make a French 75, put one teaspoon of icing sugar into a champagne flute and add the juice of half a lemon. Add 25 mils of gin and top up with champagne. Okay, so first up is the French 75. There's a chance that I might have meant to put the gin in a shaker and kind of shake it a bit to, to make it cool, but it's a very, very cold glass and the um, champagne was in the fridge, so sorry, Paul, if I've done this slightly wrong. Right, this was called the French 75 because of the French 75, I think, machine gun or artillery that was used during World War One, one of the two. Um, and in Paul's words, it's so powerful it'll knock your head off. Good. <laughs> Mmm, it's very pleasant, like, it's, it is strong, but it's not uh, noticeably strong, like, it's dangerous, I think, is probably the word I would use to describe this, because it's quite refreshing, and it's not overpowering, so, uh, I could drink a lot of this, I think. Mmm. Yeah, nice. Very nice. The next cocktail that I'm gonna make is called a white lady. Now, a barman called Harry McElhone claims that he invented this in 1919. And we know that it crops up later in the 1920s with one of the ingredients being changed and swap, swapped out for Contro. Um, but I'm gonna make the earlier, the earliest version that Paul told me about, which is the 1919, supposedly one, um, which doesn't have Contro but uses gin instead. To make a white lady, fill a cocktail shaker with ice, and add the juice of half a lemon, 25 mils of creme de menthe, and a double measure of dry gin. Shake and strain. So this is the original version that definitely was drunk through the start of the 1920s. It's very refreshing. It's um, 
I don't really normally like mint as a flavour, but that's that's quite pleasant. That's not too strong. It's sort of um, <laughs> it's like a bit toothpastey, but in a good way, in a good way. Um, and yeah, very light, very refreshing. Uh, you, I could definitely drink a whole glass of that. Um, and I know that I think Paul wants this one to have a revival. So everyone, go and make a white lady. Yes, very good. My next cocktail is one that was invented for the wedding of Princess Mary, and it is the Princess Mary's Pride. To make the Princess Mary's Pride, fill a cocktail shaker with ice and add 25 ml of French vermouth, 25 ml of Dubonnet, a double shot of Calvados, shake and strain. Okay, so this is the Princess Mary's Pride. Now, it was created by the Savoy bartender Harry Craddock on the 28th of February, 1922. Why do we know this provenance so well when, you know, notoriously cocktails are very difficult to work out who invented what exactly when? Well, we know because he invented it on the wedding day of Princess Mary, who was the Princess Royal at the time. And she was this um, beloved celebrity in Britain. So you can absolutely imagine him at the Savoy, shaking this up, telling all of those very rich clientele, I've made this, tell me what you think. Um, definitely a bit of a character. And this is his cocktail. So we know that this was invented during the 20s, and we know that it would have been drunk by those who were, you know, the fashionable elite of the time. Okay. If I describe my cocktail taste, as um, being in a pub with a clear bowl filled with neon liquid and some curly straws and maybe like, you know, an end of sparkler or two, then you'll understand why I'm not sophisticated enough for that. It is, uh, it's punchy. It is very punchy. As I think probably a lot of 1920s cocktails were, judging by the French 75. Um, but it's it's a little bit too strong for my taste. It tastes to me like other dark spirits. So it's got some element of kind of, I want to say rum, but I don't think it is a rummy element. But it's that kind of dark, um, treacly almost flavour. It's not a light, sweet, deceptive cocktail um, that I prefer. So if you like grown up cocktails, which is what I would call that, then I reckon you'd quite like the Princess Mary's Pride. But if you have um, the palette of, you know, a toddler who's just discovered Harry Bows, it's gonna be a little bit too strong for you. To make a Princess Mary, fill an ice shaker with ice, add 25 ml of white creme de cacao, 25 ml of cream, and 25 ml of dry gin. Shake and strain. And this is my final cocktail, which is just the Princess Mary. Now, this was again supposedly invented around the time of Princess Mary's wedding and it's likely that there were many cocktails, you know, named after the princess for her wedding. Um, but we only have these two really that survive with any clear provenance. Now, in reality, a drink like this probably did already exist. It's just been updated and changed slightly um, to mark the occasion. And the reason why uh, Paul said that he reckons this has obviously been around before her wedding is because it's basically just a fancy version of a drink called the Alexander. Um, which used egg white instead of cream to create this kind of thick frothiness. So it's very likely that this was updated with more expensive ingredients for the richer audience that would be enjoying a cocktail on the celebration of Princess Mary's wedding. Let's see how it tastes. Yes. Yes, that's more like it. This is like drinking ice cream out of a glass. This is, this is absolutely delicious. It's a hint of chocolate, but really not very much at all. It's just very silky, very creamy. Um, oh, it, this is good. I'm actually going to put it down because I think I'm going to make a fool of myself on camera if I just hold it. It's 
it's my favourite of all of them. Um, if you like creamy cocktails and you don't like them super punchy, uh, but you don't want to be like a wimp and just get, I don't know, like a WKD, do people still drink them? I don't know. Um, that is going to be for you. It is creamy, it is subtle, but it's very, very sophisticated. Absolutely love that one. So there you have it, four 1920s cocktails, courtesy of the aperitif guy, Paul Fogarty. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, everybody go and check him out. He knows his stuff. He is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll join me again for next time on the Pastas of Frying Pantry when I'll be cooking the 1930s.